been a hectic morning. We just got the kids out of the house. James is going to school. It's his third day back at school. He is a junior, which means second year in preschool. Because uh, what more do children need than to go to preschool, I suppose? Hope you're all having a fantastic day. It is Wednesday, middle of the week. Hope you're not burnt out yet. I'm not. I'm ready to keep going. <laughs> today, we're going to be discussing how to plug leaks. I actually have a webinar later today. I think it's 4 p.m. Eastern Time, something like that, on YouTube. You can find, find that there. We're going to be going through three leaks, but I actually have a new series coming out on PokerCoaching.com. You can get it today, actually, if you're a Poker Coaching member. You uh, have access where I go through 25 common leaks that small and medium stakes players very often have. And it turns out that whenever I'm talking to poker players and they are discussing... They're discussing um, like their play in general. Very often, it's pretty easy for me or any, any good player to pinpoint somewhat quickly a few things that they are doing very, very wrong. For example, some people will just drastically overplay top pair, right? Like, good players don't drastically overplay top pair, but a lot of players who are not crushing it may drastically overplay top pair. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. It's tough to know. But um, if you find your two or three or four leaks that you are making that cost you substantial money, in the long run, you're going to start winning a whole lot more money, right? Like, let's say you defend your big blind poorly. Let's say maybe in cash games, you defend the big blind 100% of the time, which is going to be a mistake, right? Well, if you're going to be defending your big blind 100% of the time, whereas in reality, you should be defending, you know, much less percentage of the time, 50%, 60%, 40%, whatever, depending on who you're against and the preflop raise size, which is very important, if you are consistently defending your big blind poorly, and that happens every single time you're in the big blind, you're just going to be leaking money away every single hand, right? And that's going to make it to where you are going to have a very difficult time succeeding at poker long term. So you need to figure out your leaks. But the question is, how do we figure out our leaks? If it was easy as uh, just doing it, everybody would do it and get better at poker. Well, Look, the easiest way is to just hire a coach and share your hands with them. But I realize a lot of you are not going to go hire a private coach. So there are a few other ways you can go about doing this. First, just ask yourself when you're playing what gives yourself or what gives you trouble, right? Like let's say you're playing and you feel like every time you get four bet, you don't know what to do. Or maybe you just fold, right? If you fold every time you get four bet, that could be the right play against very tight players. But certainly not against good players, right? who are going to be four betting you with the ace five suited or the ace jack off suit every once in a while. Well, you need to realize, okay, I don't know what to do in this scenario. I need to study this spot more. It's as if someone's been in my office messing around with all my, with, with my green screen back here. <sighs> don't they know that this is a green screen and you're not supposed to rearrange it? Okay. Anyway. This is not right either. What else? What else? Everything's out of order. All right, so you need to figure out how to plug your leaks. Ask yourself what gives you trouble. Very often this is one of the easiest ways to plug leaks because you know what you have a difficult time with. Well, I say you know. You may not always know. That's where you may need either a coach to look over your play or you're going to need a... Uh, basically, you want to watch other good people play and see what they are doing well that you are not doing well. If they're doing something well that you're not, then that should be enlightening to you, right? And this is why it's important to watch other good players play. Like, I try to stream my play because you all asked me to, right? Um, Faraz Jaka, streaming his play for Poker Coaching Premium members. I think that's today, today or tomorrow, one of the Zoom. Um, Draft Ganger, he is at the final table of the $10,000 buy-in World Poker Tour tournament today. He was streaming for Poker Coaching players just the other day. He's actually streaming again for Poker Coaching Premium members on Thursday. Kind of a bad beat. He said, I'll stream either Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday this week. And uh, turns out Tuesday was uh, day three of the $10,000 tournament. Wednesday, today, is the final table of the $10,000 tournament, or maybe you can win $1.7 million. 
And uh, tomorrow is just a regular day. So he decided to randomly pick tomorrow. Uh, so he, anyway, he's, I think he's streaming tomorrow as far as I know. Although I could be wrong about that. Scheduling gets gets mixed up whenever people maybe win one point seven million dollars. Turns out they they typically go on it. They take take a day off. Um, also, Blas Zarja, one of our uh, students, um, he is also at the final table of that with a m nice medium chip stack. He turned five dollars into one point three million last. Well, I guess it was two years ago now. Time flies. Since then, he won another tournament online for about two hundred fifty k. And um, middle of the pack, going for one point seven million. So check that out. That's the Party Poker ten thousand dollar buy-in tournament today. Day, the final table, day four. So congrats to both of them. It's good to see the coaches crushing it. Also, I have a new book. Do you all not know this? Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. Here's Draft Danger right here. You see him? His name's Bert. Right, right here. Um, anyway, you can get this book at um, jonathanlittlepoker.com slash excelling tough. I think that's it. Something like that. Anyway. Funny enough, Bert Stevens' chapter is on playing the middle stack at the final table, and he advocates a whole lot of limping, which is kind of neat, something I don't really do a whole lot of. Um, it's a very good chapter, very enlightening. I learned This might be the book I learned the most making. Funny enough, most, well, not most, some of the projects I do now are purely devoted to making Jonathan Little better at poker. I actively try to surround myself with the best poker players in the world, and... Whatever I learn, I turn around and I share it with all of you. So check this out. Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. I think you can get it on Amazon right now. It's a good book. Good, 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 good book. Do you think it was a coincidence he chose to stream Thursday? He picked Thursday about a month ago. <laughs> we, try, we have a content uh, calendar planned out that uh, we, tr we try to line up everything so that you know coaches aren't scheduling stuff all, all on top of each other. Louis Philippe took 20th in the World Poker... W, the W Coop Slam. Nice. Nice job. All right. We raise aces. We get a bunch of callers. It comes 1098. Do we bet? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Today is Wednesday. Today is Wednesday. Exactly. All right. So you want to identify your leaks. You want to either ask good players what you're doing wrong. You want to observe what the winning players at your table are doing. And also, you want to um, like figure out what is giving you trouble, right? So you want to essentially try to identify your leaks. And when you identify them, write them down and make a point to study them away from the table. Don't just think, okay, I'm not defending my big blind well. Period. You forget about it. And if you forget about it, then like, what, what good does it do you, right? If you don't actively work on your leaks, then you're not going to improve. So once you have identified your leaks, like back in the day, I, identif I identified that I had a tough time playing against Maniacs on my left. I had a really tough time against it. So what did I do? Did I just say, okay, I'm just going to forget about it? No, I, I sat back and I studied that scenario a ton. And um, that's, that's what you want to do. You want to figure out the spots that you're having trouble with and you want to actively study them. Okay, so uh, someone's asked, what, what book do I suggest for someone who wants to get good enough at one, two to move up? Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. Get it at jlpoker.com slash mastering. Whose business makes more money, mine or some other private business that I have no insight into? It's not a very good question because I clearly have no insight into other people's private businesses. You struggle against loose players as well, as their play makes no sense. What do you suggest I do? Well, see, look, Najan, this is where it's very important for you to sit back and ask, what are they doing that gives me problems? Like, you want to ask a lot of questions, essentially. You want to figure out why you're having trouble with this. And see, you coming to me to ask me the answer. This is what you would do with a private coach, right? If you want to make your life easy, just hire a private coach. I'll tell you exactly what to do. But interestingly enough, this question you're asking... I've already answered it at PokerCoaching.com. If you go there in the uh, classes section, if you sign up for a premium membership, you will see right there that I've already answered how to play against Maniacs when they're on your left, when they're on your right, when they three-bet you a ton, when they raise you on the flop a ton. I've explained like literally everything you need to know to beat Maniacs because I know that's a very common question that students will ask on a very, very regular basis, right? So if you can very clearly pinpoint what your question is, Go to PokerCoaching.com. I probably have already answered it. If I haven't, and you're a Poker Coaching member, send me an email, ask me the question, 
And if there's not a video there on it, I'll make the video because I want the site to be fully comprehensive because, you know, like I want, I want, I want the site to be a one-stop shop to where you can essentially get everything you need. So study the classes. Next, like I said, have a coach, but also you want to be able to sit down and develop strategies. Poker is a strategy game, right? That is part of the fun. And if you cannot take a step back and ask, what are they doing that's giving me problems and what can I do about it? You're going to have a tough time winning at poker because when you're sitting there at the poker table, you need to be able to make these adjustments in game so that you don't continue making errors, right? So let's, let's take this example. Say we do have someone on our left who three bets us a lot. Take a second. What can we do? We have a few options, right? Which, which of these we want to go with? And you may say, I don't know. I'm not the pro. But look, this is stuff you have to do. You have to think about what is giving me a problem so that we can go about attacking it. So take a second. Think about it. Someone on our left is three betting us a lot, and we don't like it. What are our options? Well, pause the video if you're watching this in the past. I know you're all, half of you are watching this here live. Um, first, you want to say to, uh, the easy way to fix this problem, the low variance solution, is to just raise stronger hands to begin with. Stop raising the weaker hands, right? So if we tighten up our initial range, that will allow us to defend against the three bets more often, right? Seaboss says here, switch, uh, change to a different table. I mean, like, like you have to understand though, Sometimes that's not an option. And also taking the very easy way out is also very often not the option. Wouldn't you rather just be able to crush this player even though they're on your left? So tighten your initial range. That's going to make it to where you can defend against their three bets better across the board. Now you may not want to tighten your range because let's say this maniac on your left is pretty loose and active, but everybody else at the table is really tight. In that scenario, you are going to want to still open a lot of hands, right? So if you still want to open a lot of hands, but you have this maniac on your left, you should still open kind of wide, but now we need to be four betting a lot because that is going to result in your opponent who has a range that is presumably way too wide because he's three betting too often, having to fold to your four bet a lot of the time. Now, if he doesn't fold to your four bet, let's say he always five bets all in. Let's say every time you raise, he three bets, and if you four bet, he's going to rip it all in every time for 100 big blinds or 150 big blinds, whatever. What do we do now? Take a second, think about it. Well, you have to be willing to get it all in wider for something like 100-something big blinds, right? So let's say we have ace-jack suited against this player, where you raise, he three bets, you four bet, he rips it in, you call for 150 big blinds. Sometimes you're going to win, sometimes you're going to lose. And it's okay, right? And you need to be paying attention to what he's showing up with when he turns up his hand in that five-bet pot. If he's always turning up ace king or pocket tens or pocket queens, then okay, maybe you have realized this player is not getting it in too wide. But if they're showing up with king six suited and ace five offsuit, you have found a really good spot because this player is just going to blast their money in the pot. You have to accept variance. That's exactly right. You have to realize you are going to experience a lot of variance against a maniac. Now, that's one extreme type of maniac. What about another type of maniac? Well, what about the type of maniac who's going to call your four bet a lot? They're going to three bet you a lot. And then they're going to call your four bet a lot. So now we're going to be playing a, um, I don't know, let's say a 50 big blind pot post flop with let's say 75 big blind stacks behind. Well, now you want to ask, what does this player do wrong post flop? Do we have any clue? Do we have any idea? If we don't have any idea, just play roughly the game theory optimal strategy from this point on, knowing the opponent's range is starting a little bit too wide, or maybe a lot too wide. If um, your opponent will bet every time you check, but play straightforwardly if you bet, Let's, that's if they're going to be playing straightforwardly against aggression, but once you check, they just try to steal every pot. Against those players, continuation bet with all of your garbage and maybe only a little bit of your good hands or maybe none of your good hands, and then check all of your good hands to induce a bluff. So you see, like, we're trying to figure out what does this player do wrong, okay? Once we figure out what they do wrong, we can then develop a strategy to combat that. And all of this started from, I have a problem playing against aggressive players on my left, Right? Here, Joe D says something. Very, very easy way to find to plug a leak. Nobody folds to bluffs, and you got no cards for six hours. What are you going to do? Do I just lose my money? Well, no. First off, if you get no cards, don't play bad cards. I don't know how you're losing three buy-ins in six hours. I presume you mean of live poker. 
If you're losing three blinds in six hours of live poker, that's a, that's 50 big blinds per hour. If you just blind out, because like you said, you have literally no cards, that costs you what? 10 big blinds per hour? So you should only lose uh, 60 big blinds on the day if you literally blind out. If you get totally bad cards, just don't play. And if no one folds your bluffs, what should you do? Stop bluffing, right? I mean, this is not rocket science here. If people call your bets every time because they're extreme calling stations, only value bet and start value betting thinner because they're going to call down with bottom pair and better every time. You should bet the flop and the turn and the river with hands like middle pair, good kicker because you're going to usually be in decent shape, right? So like, don't just complain and say, oh, what can I do? What am I missing? You're not thinking about how to go about developing a strategy to beat whatever your opponents do wrong. And people do all sorts of stuff wrong, right? I mean, we just discussed playing against a maniac, and we've already discussed playing against a calling station, and it's taken us, what, like four minutes to do this. And if your opponents make very, very obvious mistakes, and a lot of them will, especially in the small six games, you should adjust. And yeah, if you get no cards, and your opponent outdraws you every hand, yeah, you're going to lose, right? I mean, that's that's part of the game. That's, that's standard default variance, right? Okay, so once we've figured out what we need to do, let's say we are playing against that Maniac, and I know I still want to open wide, so I'm going to have to start four betting a little bit more often. You actually have to be willing to do it. You must be willing to actually make the play. It's very easy to say away from the table, all right, I'm going to start four betting more, but then you just forget to do it. Um, a good example of this is me. I've been trying to triple barrel more, small blind versus big blind. Everyone folds me in the small blind. I'm raising preflop, betting flop, betting turn, betting river very, 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 very frequently. Okay? And sometimes I just straight up forget. <laughs> They'll fold me and I will just like limp small blind, which is a perfectly fine play. It's what I've done for a long time. It's definitively profitable. But I think triple barreling is more profitable in addition, or in exchange for a bit more variance, right? So um, sometimes I just straight up forget. Why am I straight up forgetting? I'm a good poker player. I'm doing my best to attack these spots to the best of my ability. Why am I sporadically forgetting? Because whenever you're not fully focused, you go back to your default strategy, whatever that is, right? Whenever you're tilted, and when I say tilted, I mean just not playing your most focused poker, you might forget stuff. Like um, if I'm playing online and playing 15 tables at a time, and I'm busy playing another table that's very relevant, I just may forget this other random table where they folded me in the small blind and I have the you know, king six offsuit hand that I'm, I'd like to play, but you know, Maybe I'm not always looking to triple barrel it, but maybe I should be looking to triple barrel it, right? So I forget, essentially, what it amounts to. And I think this is what a lot of people don't quite recognize, is that very rarely when you're playing are you going to be 100% focused on this exact scenario, especially if you're playing online, and that's going to result in you not playing your best. And this is where things like mindset become very relevant. And whenever you do mess up, you have to be able to let it go. You know, Make sure you don't do it again in the future, but do your best to let it go. So you must be willing to implement the play. A good example of this is my dad. Taught, I taught my dad a long time ago, whenever he was playing, to um, jam all in for like 20 big blinds over an initial raise. Somebody raises, you have jack-10 suited, rip it all in with your jack-10 suited. Why? Because your opponents are going to fold way too often, and when they call, you still have some equity. Good, fundamental, ABC poker, nothing fancy here, but my dad wasn't doing it. He was just always flat calling, always seeing a flop, and always going from there. And... That resulted in him not winning a whole lot of tournaments because you just miss the flop, lose your two or, two or three big blinds, and, and go from there. One day he decided, you know what? I'm going to lose anyway, <laughs> so I might as well listen to Jonathan and try to rip it in here. And you know what happened? He won that first tournament he started doing it, and then he continued to have good success. And, you know, clearly there's various winning that exact tournament because he couldn't shove the Jack-10 suit and got called by aces and mid out. But turns out they all folded, and they thought he was a nit, so they folded and folded and folded and folded and folded, and he just won the tournament, and he never really had a hand. And if your opponents think you are tight, if they think you're never out of line, well, now you're just going to be able to demolish them, right? Because if they think you're never out of line, yet here you are getting well out of line, they're going to drastically overfold. They are trying to exploit you, right? They think, okay, this player is really tight. Whenever they four bet me all in, or three bet me all in, whatever it is, I should fold. So they're going to overfold. And if they're going to overfold, what should you do? Take a second, think about it. If your opponents are going to fold too often, what should you do? This is an easy one. You should bluff more often, right? Jan says you're confused in a spot. For example, queen, seven, two. You have eight, seven. Matt Affleck suggests you bet. 
because you want to protect against overcards. Acevedo suggests check. So look, this is a scenario where it depends on who you're against, depends on the on um, the positions, etc. I typically just bet everything on queen 7 2. That said, if you want to have a hand to check, stuff like middle pair and top pair bad kicker are very good hands to check. It's like pocket jacks is a good one to check. You essentially want to ask, can I? What happens if I get raised? If your opponents are going to raise you decently often, then you definitely should not be betting middle pair type hands. But um, if they're going to call or fold a lot, then it becomes fine. Let's suppose a tight play at your table lets you buy in for 50 to 100 big blinds. Should you start with the maximum or the minimum? Wait, you're a tight player. It, it, whenever you're playing poker, you want to ask, where is the edge coming from? And if, in general, you want the players on your right to have a lot of chips and the players on your left to have relatively few because you lose money to the players on your left, you win money from the players on your right, right? So you, if you sit down at the table and the players on your right all have 20 big blinds and the players on your left all have 100, well, you should probably buy in for 20. My dad just tried to call me on the phone. Sorry about that. Um, so you, since you lose money to the players on your left, you want to be losing small pots on your left big, uh, and winning big pots from your right. So very often the distribution of the chip stacks at the table is what defines how much you buy in for. Now, if the player on your left is just like terrible, then maybe you can buy in for that. This is um, a really important concept as stacks get way deeper. Like say you go to, well, at least back in the day, say you go to Bellagio and you sit at 10, 20, no limit. You can buy in for any amount, right? So if you sit down and three play, or let's say all the players have $2,000, 100 big blinds, besides one player who has 40,000, as will often be the case, every once in a while somebody just takes all the money they have in their box and they put it on the table. Well, if that 40,000 chip stack is on your left, you don't want to have a deep stack because even if that player is not particularly great, you don't want the big stack to have position on you. So what a lot of people do nonsensically is they think, I'm so good at poker, I always want to cover everybody else. So then they sit down with a 40,000 stack, out of position against another 40,000 stack, and you're just going to get demolished. But if you have position on that 40,000 stack, then buy in for as much as you can because you want to be in position against the other deep stack. And if that other deep stack is smart, they're going to move seats immediately and try to get a better seat on you, which you know a lot of them do. They realize this concept very, very well. So it's not just always buy in for the max or always buy in for the minimum. That's, that does not work. Should nits show their bluffs? No. If you're a nit, you make money because your opponents fold too often to your bets. Well, at least they should. They, they will fold too often to your bets, right? So you don't want to do anything that induces them to... So look, you can take this either way, right? One way, it's really like a leveling thing, right? You want to get in leveling wars against people, you don't know how they're going to react. You can take this one way. I'm going to show them my bluffs. That's going to make them call me more often. I know I'm not going to bluff again in the future. Therefore, I want them to call me in the future. Or you can take it the other way. People think I'm a nit. Therefore, I want all of my bluffs to get through. If I'm going to show them my bluffs, it means my bluffs are not going to get through anymore. So you can see how this could go either way, right? How do I feel about Poker Snowy training? I'm not exactly sure what Poker Snowy training means. I know that Poker Snowy is a program that I think teaches good, generally tight, aggressive, fundamentally sound poker, and I would recommend it to people, especially cash game players and like heads up players and whatnot. In a home game, wait, what? I don't know what you're saying, Dean. You get it, but you don't. This concept about losing to your left, winning from your right. Is it the same concept as position? Yeah. Whenever you're, whenever you're, you lose money to the people on your left because they have position on you more often than not, right? So people in position win money off of you on average. And you win money off of people who you have position on, right? So you win money off the people on your right because you have position on them more often than not. How do you fight discouragement? It's not tilt. It's just about making good choices. Fight through it. I mean, are you saying that if you make a bad play, how do you get over it? I mean, look, the other day I was playing and I was struggling with various poker uh, lobbies on, on my computer. And I just like randomly misclick or not, not really know what's going on on the game. And I, I'm like, you have to be able to forgive yourself whenever you make a forgivable error. And eventually, if you're making the same error over, over, over and over and over again, it, it may no longer be forgivable. But um, you want to get over things quickly, right? Do your best to get over, over stuff. If you make a mistake, yeah, you made a mistake. Take note of it and don't do it again in the future, right? Um, I was playing on a site the other day and like the ante was almost always like right in front of me in the big blind. 
or I'm sorry, it was right in front of me a lot of the time where I was sitting at the table and it made me think I was in the big blind because there were just chips literally right in front of me. And um, so when someone would raise, very often I would just click the call button thinking I was in the big blind calling, right? But in reality, it just like folded me in middle position. So I was limping, which is, is stupid, right? So that's, that's just me having to understand how this program works and you can sidestep. Or you'll learn those things soon enough. <sighs> it's weird to see you always raise the two big blinds and everybody limps with marginal hands. Well, people play differently, right? Very important thing to note. A lot of small stakes players have a hard time identifying their leaks. You want to know why? Because they compare their play to um, everybody else's play in their games. And if you compare your play to everybody else's play in your games, then... If they're all making the same errors, if everybody's making the same errors, then you're not really going to see the things you should be doing properly. You're not even going to necessarily see good players winning if nobody's winning. They're all just doing the same thing. Like a good example is everybody in your game raises a six big blinds preflop. You're never going to realize that raising smaller is just better because everybody does it and everybody just follows the leader. When am I going to announce the person who won the book giveaway? I think we sent out an email already. Maybe we didn't. I'll tell you who it is. The winner, 12 ebooks, a year of poker coaching premium, is Mark Kaufman. Mark Kaufman, if, if you're here, you win 12 ebooks, including Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. You also win a year of poker coaching premium. But I think we sent out an email about that already. Maybe we didn't, though. I'm not sure. I only personally send out some of the emails, not all of them. What do you think about the solvers being in the game? Versus the exploitative play that's being taught at poker coaching. Well, you have to understand that we teach exploitative play at poker coach. Or we, we teach GTO play and exploitative play. It's very important to understand that solvers can do more than only tell you the GTO strategy, right? If, to use the solver properly, you need to be able to adjust the strategy that it gives for the opponent. If you only... Assume it tells you what to do against a GTO player. That's just ridiculous because your opponents don't play GTO poker. I mean, we talked about this in the last poker coaching homework where I go through and I show the GTO strategy compared to mine. I'm like, yeah, people just are not doing this. So if people do not do what the solver says they should do, then you should not play as the solver suggests you play, right? That's just common sense. For example, if your opponent never bluffs the river, should you bluff catch sometimes on the river with your, with your hands that cannot be value hands? The answer is obviously no, right? Because whenever you call, you always lose. You just want to always lose? Like, obviously not. You don't want to always lose. So you should always adjust. It's called node locking. If you want to look up node locking, you can look up that and you can learn how to node lock and go from there. But at Poker Coaching, we have, I mean, I, I hired the GTO expert, Michael Acevedo. He wrote the book Modern Poker Theory. Um, he was the guy who I learned a ton about GTO from. He was like the main GTO guy at the Poker Backing Company that I advise. I'm like, oh my god, this guy's a genius. Oh, he actually won 86,000 bucks the other day. He took second place in a um, in a WCOOP tournament. So that's good for him. Nice score for him. He, he had a stretch of a whole lot of like eighth and ninth places, which are certainly annoying. I know. I mean, I've, I've experienced that myself sometimes, but I'm glad to see him break through with the second place for 86k two days ago. Anyway, um, he has lots of, lots of uh, classes at poker coaching in the premium section on how to play like the straight GTO strategy and then also how to adjust to whatever your opponent's doing correctly. The king nine house hand, you're saying that essentially dealers point out the hand. I, I still don't even know what you're saying, Bill. I, it seems like there's some superstitious thing or something. I don't even know what you're saying. 25 leaks course sound great. I think you'll get your membership back. Good, do it. Go to pokercoaching.com slash 25 leaks. It's available in my standard membership. Check it out. Is there merit to reading books like Super System? Uh, if you have a lot of free time, I would definitely recommend you read the things that are very applicable to the games you are playing today. Um, Harrington on Hold'em is still a great book if you're playing against very straightforward players who just like don't get out of line. If you're playing against very, very straightforward players who are weak and tight and passive, Harrington on Hold'em is a good book for you. If you're playing against players who play um, more than only the best hands, then you probably want to get something different. 
Um, Super System was a great book back in the day, but it's more of like just a primer on various games, like 20 pages on various games. Like I know their Limit Hold'em section by Bobby Baldwin seems like a great guy from everything I hear. It, it was talking about Limit Hold'em when there's one blind. I, haven't ne- I've, I have never seen a Limit Hold'em game with one blind. So to some extent, that whole chapter was outdated whenever I even started playing poker back in 2003, right? So that's uh, relatively outdated. When you 3-bet a higher stakes from the button versus the big blind, do they think it is a sign of weakness? No, they think it's a sign of a good, fundamentally sound strategy. Whenever you 3-bet, you always have some good hands and you always have some bluffs. Marcelo, I have no clue what you're even referring to. Doyle's strategy was based on no limit holding with a huge ante, right? Was that why he was so insanely aggressive? I don't actually remember. Read that book a long time ago. I have I have a very, very old copy of it. Maybe I should go get it. It's like, um, it's all beat up. You know what? I am going to go get it. I'm going to be back in like 30 seconds. Don't leave. Y'all may not know this. I'm a collector of fun stuff. Here we have solid old copy of Super System by Doyle Texas Dolly Brunson. Yeah, yeah. Look at this cute picture. How nice. This is all of them playing poker. Yeah. What else do we have in here? It's kind of like it's selling a No Limit Hold'em. It expired it to some, expired it to some extent. So anyway, cool stuff. This book is dedicated to Louise, Doyla, Pam, and Todd. How nice. How nice, how nice. And special dedication to the Binion family and their contribution to poker. Benny Binion said, trust everyone, but always cut the, cut the deck. This is apparently Jimmy the Greek. I have had no interaction with Jimmy the Greek. He probably isn't with us anymore today. Anyway. Deception. Check raising. Position. Slow playing. Ace to five low, low draw examples. You know, all sorts of stuff. Cool old book, though. Oh, <laughs> look at this. We have the Oldsmobile, the Jesse James, the American Airlines, the Twiggy, the Union Oil. Classic. Classic, right? And then we have Super System 2. You can only get this book by um, getting a lot of, paying a lot of rake on Doyle's room, I think, back in the day. Genius concept. You had to pay like, I don't know, like 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks in rake to get this book. I didn't pay any rake on that site. I bought this book for $10 on eBay. But anyway, cool stuff. Same, same selection of hands on the back. You know, they got to go retro. I wonder if they have the same image in the front. Hey, look, this one's even signed. I, I don't think I even knew that. I think that says to Sassy. Fun stuff. To Sassy, may the flop be with you. Yeah? Yeah? What else do we have? To Jack, to Benny and Jack, Benny and to, and to the World Poker Tour. All right. Look, they have PowerPoint slides in here because, you know, every good book needs PowerPoint slides. Anyway, fun stuff. Do you all know the nickname of the 6-3 offsuit? I didn't until right now. Is it on this one too? It is. You could probably you probably saw it on the other one. It is the blocky. Do you know the uh, ten five maybe of spades? That is called the Woolworth. Maybe it's five ten of spades. Does it have to be backwards? <sighs> anyway, that's that. These books though. Inspired me to write it selling at No Limit Hold'em, and then that book was a huge success. So 
We have Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em, like I said. If you want a nice, fun sweat today, Bert Stevens, Draft Ganger right here. Number one player in the world in 2017 online. He um, is at the final table of the World Poker Tour $10,000 buy-in tournament. $1.7 million for first place. Also, poker coaching member Blas Zerjow there as well, right in the middle of the pack. So two fun sweats there today. That'll be a lot of fun. Bert's chapter was on playing the middle stack at the final table. Now, now instead of PowerPoints, we have Pio Solver charts. So, you know, we've, we've changed the way poker books are made to some extent. We have, uh, you know, equity, equity distri distributions on various turn cards, when they're good for you, when they're bad for you. You know, things have changed a little bit. Cute book, huh? We still have pictures of people. Oh, look at Cavalito, PKO tournament strategy. You know, fun stuff. War Woolworth is a store referred to as a five and dime store, hence the five and ten. All right, cool. <laughs> Oh, fun stuff. You're new to PokerCoaching.com. You went through the fundamentals course. There's so much content. There is so much content. So look, Mark, send me an email. Make it like two paragraphs long explaining the situation you are in and what you are trying to find, and I will send you to specifically that content that I think is most relevant for you. How do you get the new book? Go to jlpoker.com slash excelling tough. Let me see if that's right. See if that works. I think that's right. Please work. Please work. Oh, boom. It does work. Skill game. Okay. JLPoker.com slash excelling tough. I just typed it in the chat there. Go for it. Or good. JL is greatness. Well, thank you. I do my best. My video on going for it in tournaments last week. You did it. Second place in two tournaments for 4000 bucks. Congrats. Is streaming your game detrimental to your learning curve? Um, so look, when you're streaming, if you're new to streaming, you're going to get like three viewers. So it's almost like you're not really streaming. It's more of like you're sitting there thinking out your thoughts and discussing your thought processes, right? So I don't think that's detrimental at all. Streaming becomes starts to become a little bit detrimental whenever you're like trying to interact with a thousand people in the chat. Um, so you have to like kind of tone it out sometimes. That that becomes like just a like multi multitasking exercise. But like no, I, I think you actually should when you're playing record your sessions and speak out and talk out all the reasoning for everything you do. And whenever you're streaming to two or three people, maybe they'll give you some feedback. Not that it's necessarily good, but they may give you some feedback and it can make you think. Okay, bankrolls up by fifty percent. Congrats. 6-3 is called slimy here because you have to be a little bit slimy to play it. <laughs> is there an audiobook for this book, for this uh, Excelling It Tough? Not yet. It'll be available at some point. I'm actually going to record it next month. Sound Studio got closed because of COVID. Turns out they don't want you sitting in little boxes with other people. Will it be at Barnes & Noble? I hope so. It's definitely on Amazon. How should you have built your bankroll before you move from the micros to tournaments? Not sure about what exactly you're asking. Read jlpoker.com slash bankroll. You can only exploit if you know where equilibrium is. Um, I'm not going to say you can only do it, but I mean, I'm a big fan of knowing how to play reasonably, fundamentally sound strategy and then adjusting back there in case things go poorly. That's for sure. That's a huge coffee mug. Look how big it is. It's as big as my head. Look at that. It's a giant coffee mug, huh? It's actually not. It's like regular size. It does end up getting cold. I don't really care, though. Oh, if you're enjoying this, yeah, smash the like button. Click the like button. I don't really care about comfort all that much. I would rather my coffee be hot, but if it's not hot, it's like not the end of the world to me. Um, for example, every morning I drink this giant smoothie that is kale and spinach and carrots and parsley and a little bit of blueberries and some chia seeds. And it does not taste particularly great, but I down it. Why? Because it's good for you. Where else am I streaming this besides Instagram? Instagram's the uh, the annoying part of the streaming process. Let me show you what I have to do to make Instagram work. Whoa, look, we have to have this whole, whole separate setup. You see this? Everyone on Instagram, you see that little camera right there? I wish you were watching through that. Um, we're streaming this on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. Periscope, is that a thing? Um, YouTube.com slash poker coaching, twitch.tv slash Jonathan Little. Okay, go there, 
you'll have a much better viewing experience because you can see all the chat boxes of everybody else. If I need to show my screen, you can see that. Unfortunately, Instagram does not make sharing this content easy. Is Periscope a thing? Look at this symbol right here. Periscope is a thing. This is actually Twitter, though. I think Twitter and Periscope combined. Just implemented a new check raising strategy that you saw. Good, good. I hope it's useful. Is there anything in that book that hasn't been covered by your videos? Yeah. Funny enough, we did not have any PKO content on poker coaching, really. I just had Draft Danger make some content last week. But um, PKO chapter in here is excellent. I actually got the uh, PKO bounty calculator that's on poker coaching in the tool section from Cavalito from this chapter. So that was very useful. Um, Vlada. I didn't know Vlada until I, until I started writing this book. I asked um, the people at Pokar who are, like, who are your best people. They said Vlada. I'm like, okay, Vlada, sure. We'll, we'll let Vlada write something. He wrote on ICM preflop and postflop and final tables with all sorts of stack depths. And I learned a lot about playing postflop ICM scenarios. And then, would you believe it? Just like a month ago, he won a million dollars in the $10,000 stadium series on PokerStars. He won it. Outright won it. So that was cool. Um, funny enough, that same day, Draft Danger and John Van Fleet, Ape Styles. He might be the biggest winner in online tournaments, actually. This guy right here, Ape Styles, crushes it. Um, they were both they both had very good runs that day, too. So I learned a lot from that. Richard Hoadley had a chapter on um, was this a good bluff or not? Good punt or bad punt? Because <laughs> they maybe didn't work out. So he goes through the solver, explains how to adjust to whatever your opponent's doing correctly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Alex Carr, he is the... C-A-R-R, Pokar, P-O-C-A-R. He is um, main owner and head manager of Pokar, and he discusses how to be a productive human to some extent because his job is to make sure his backies stay sane because it's actually not all that hard to get pretty good at poker if you devote your life to it. And at Pokar, they, you know, they, they take on backies who are going to devote their life to getting good at poker. And he has to make sure they develop as humans, not just as poker players. So anyway, lots and lots of cool stuff in here. What's Matt Brown's chapter on? I'm trying to think I remember this one. Okay. So anyway, good stuff. Check it out. Selling a tough no limit holding games. I'm a big fan of collaborating with people. It is good to find other people who are at the top of the game who are happy to work with other people who want to better the game and to collaborate with them. Because you never know where these things are, are going to go. Um, for example, Modern Poker Theory, right? That, a whole book came out of me working with Michael Acevedo and now he's a coach of poker coaching. I like working with Giraffe Ganger. He was easy to work with. His chapter was great. I learned a lot with it. Now he's a coach for us, right? Like I enjoy working with people who want to make the poker world better and who are good, generally easy to work with people. And everybody here with this book was, was easy to work with, so that, that's good. Sometimes it's not so easy, but it was easy this time. It took a long time, but it was still easy. So anyway, check it out, uh, jlpoker.com slash excellingtough. I'll put the link here again. Go get it. All right, I have to get going. Have I tried Poker Snowy? Yes, 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 yes. Go search Jonathan Little Poker Snowy on YouTube, and it'll come right up. I have some videos of me playing against it. It's a little bit old now. I guess those videos are like a year, year and a half old. So maybe it's um, maybe, maybe they've updated the program since then, but I, I always thought it was like a good, fundamentally sound poker tool. All right, have a great day. I have an interview coming up, so I should probably walk outside and not be so hot in this office. When you have the second nuts and your opponent check raises you all in, and you know he has the nuts, but you can't fold. Well, why can't you fold? If you know your opponent has the nuts, this goes back to what we were saying, right? Let's say you're playing a game where you know for a fact when your opponent check raises you on the river that they have the nuts. Okay? When that's the case... What should you do? Well, you should fold. You should fold. And if you know that your opponent has the nuts, don't pay them off. You can still fold. What do you think about staking groups that offer coaching? I think Pokar is great. I mean, I've learned a lot from their content, and I know they've made a lot of very good players, and I know their players make money. So um, what do I think of that? I think it's a good thing to do, especially if you don't necessarily have any money for coaching. Um, if you know you're going to be devoting yourself to poker, I think it's a very, very good way to go. The problem is, is like most backing groups are going to require you to um, 
like put in a lot of volume, right? They're not going to back you if you're going to play on the weekends or whatever. They're going to only back you if you're going to devote your life to getting good at poker, which which a lot of people just don't want to do. And also, like there are good um, educational resources out there that are pretty cheap nowadays, like PokerCoaching.com, right? If you're going to be even just playing on the weekends, you can get a premium membership. It costs you like a few bucks a day. If you're not going to get a few dollars a day out of studying from some of the best poker players in the world, then I mean, what are you doing, right? Have we tried the DTO poker software? So I, I think you're referring to the app on the phone. I think it's good for, it, it does what it says it does, but I think it's not applicable to real world play because I, first off, I don't think it starts off with the right preflop ranges for what humans actually do. Um, it, it presumes that you're using GTO preflop ranges to start, which I don't think people do. And also it presumes you're gonna play perfect, G, it, it presumes the bot plays perfect GTO poker post flop, which I don't think humans do as well. So I think it is good. It does exactly what it says it's going to do, and I think it does it very well, but I don't know if it's so applicable to the real world. That said, I use it. I like it. It's fun. haven't used it in a few months, but it's fun. All right. I'm going to go now. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Make the most of your experience. All you can do is better yourself, better the world, and um, hope to see you all succeed. Good luck in your games. Plug those leaks. Have fun. I'm going to be doing a webinar later today, 4 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to be going through three very common leaks that I want to be sure you do not have. That's going to be on youtube.com slash pokercoaching. Also, if you want to get access to those 25 leaks, go to pokercoaching.com slash 25 leaks. If you're already a Poker Coaching member, it's right there in the courses tab. It should be, should be right there. Um, go through it. There are quizzes to make sure you fully understand each of these concepts. And I want to make sure you have none of these 25 leaks. And it turns out if you have none of these 25 leaks, well, you're off to a pretty good start. Thomas, 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 Thomas you want to say hello? Come here. Come here. You want to say hello? Ugh. Here's big Thomas. Can you say hello? Hello. Can you wave hello? Hello. Hello. Can you blow a kiss? Mm. Were you outside? Was it nice? No, no. Oh, my big baby. He's growing up so fast. He walks his brother all the way to school now. You want to go play? Yeah, we'll go play for five minutes. If you have children, you're going to learn that you want to cherish your time with your children. Who'd have thought you want to hang out with a one-year-old baby? But, um, turns out you do. You like your ball? Can you, can you shake it? Show them how you shake it. Shake, 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 shake. Yeah, all right. Everybody have a good day. Enjoy yourselves, and I will see all of you, well, later today, 4 p.m. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Can you say bye-bye? <laughs>